Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Improving Preclinical and Clinical Regulatory Submissions Through Enhanced ECG Interval and Arrhythmia Assessment. This is Haley McCaffrey from Inside Scientific and I will be your host for today's event. Our session is sponsored by VivaQuant and will feature experts in preclinical and clinical ECG safety assessment discuss how advances in arrhythmia detection and concentration effects modeling improve study outcomes. First, we will hear from Dr. J. W. Mason from the University of Utah, who will discuss reductions in interval measurement variability in confidence limits in concentration effect models and review the implications for clinical TQT studies and phase one studies supporting TQT waivers, supporting why tighter confidence limits and more accurate measurements matter. Following, we will hear from Dr. Michael Grilinski, CEO and co-founder of Core Dynamics, who will offer a preclinical perspective on the potential of incorporating detailed assessment of arrhythmias for every cardiovascular study. Additionally, he will share his thoughts on how and when this additional information should be leveraged. He will discuss the value of knowledge versus liability of disclosure, the potential value of pre-study arrhythmia screening, and incorporating baseline control and arrhythmia assessment. On behalf of our sponsor, VivaQuant, I would like to note that the development of the underlying technology you are going to hear about today was supported in part by grants from the NIBA and NHLBI at the National Institutes of Health. I'll be talking about uh, ECG measurement and analysis methods in drug development. And there are uh, three aspects of this which form the background for uh, our discussion. And I think all of you are familiar with these three, but I will briefly uh, introduce them. Uh, Haley, I'm seeing Q&A on the screen rather than my slide. There's my slide. Um, first, the thorough QT study. Uh, as I think most of you know, this is required for uh, development of most drugs. Uh, the thorough QT study should really be called the thorough ECG study since FDA and the other regulatory uh, agencies are uh, interested in uh, all the ECG intervals. The thorough QT study is usually done prior to the initiation of phase three. Um, and uh, as you can see from the graph on the right, it is an examination of the change in ECG intervals uh, at pre-specified time points. And in that example, you're looking at uh, there is a, um, a, a three-armed study, uh, including placebo uh, in blue, uh, the investigational drug in green, and a, an active control, in that case, moxifloxacin, uh, shown in uh, red. Now, the concentration QT modeling approach, or concentration ECG modeling, is also acceptable uh, by FDA for uh, assessing QT and the other ECG in intervals. And if it's properly performed, uh, it uh, basically provides a, a thorough QT waiver to the sponsor. Uh, finally, oh, I, let, I just want to mention that the, the CE modeling is usually done in the first in human uh, studies at the very beginning of uh, phase one clinical studies, but can be done at different time points. Uh, it, its earliness does give the uh, sponsor an early answer about electrocardiography, which, of course, uh, can be advantageous. Now, the third uh, background point is the FDA SIPA project. <clears throat> SIPA stands for Comprehensive In Vitro Proarrhythmia Assay. And, and this project includes ECG biomarkers, specifically QTC, J to T peak and T peak to T end, the latter two being segments of the T wave, and we'll be discussing that in more detail in just a moment. Now, going on to the, <clears throat> the next slide, 
this slide uh, just reviews the objectives of our talk today. <clears throat> we are going to examine two algorithms for ECG biomarker measurement. One is uh, an algorithm developed by the FDA. Uh, the second is an algorithm developed by VivaQuant, which is called Rhythm Express. And we'll be discussing these in the context of concentration ECG modeling. In order to do that, <clears throat> we will analyze a data set with both, both software algorithms, uh, a data set that was made available by the FDA for uh, public use. Uh, that study included 22 subjects. It was a five-armed crossover design uh, with five treatments, placebo, dofetilide, quinidine, ranolazine, and verapamil. And you'll see the rationale behind those uh, treatment choices in just a moment. We're going on to the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> this slide shows you the analytical differences between the FDA algorithm and uh, the uh, Rhythm Express uh, VivaQuant algorithm. First of all, uh, regarding uh, noise reduction, the FDA uses a signal averaging approach while Rhythm Express uses a spatially selective denoising approach. I'm not going to be able to get into the details of these methods, although we may be able to address that in the Q&A, but I do want to highlight the differences here. FDA uh, measures intervals on a signal average speed from the 10-second ECG, while Rhythm Express measures all of the uh, good beats from the 10-second period and then averages those uh, results. Uh, classification of T-wave morphology in the FDA algorithm is done with a decision tree rule-based approach. In Rhythm Express, machine learning is used to classify T-wave morphology. The uh, T-wave offset is identified by the peak of the first derivative in the FDA method, uh, where Rhythm Express uses a wavelet-based emphasis signal to do this. <clears throat> and finally, the uh, peak of the T wave, TP, in the FDA algorithm is the largest peak in the T wave, uh, and that is usually the first peak when there is uh, a bifid or multi peaked T wave, <clears throat> where Rhythm Express always uses the last significant peak of the T wave. So obviously, these differences in analysis have the potential for leading to differences in results, and um, we'll discuss that in just one moment. <clears throat> the next slide um, gives you a little more insight into uh, T-wave segmentation. Um, and there it is on my screen now. <clears throat> if you would focus at the bottom where we have a uh, an ECG waveform, you can see that the QT interval is measured from the onset of the QRS complex uh, at the onset of the Q wave to the end of the T wave. And the T wave segments are uh, first the J to T peak segment measured from the end of the J wave, beginning of the T wave, to the peak of the T wave and the T-peak to T-N measured from peak of T-wave to end of T-wave. Now, if we refer up to the actual potential above the ECG waveform, you can see that during the J to T-peak period, uh, the calcium and late sodium inward currents are occurring. And toward the end of the J T-peak segment, the um, outward herd potassium current uh, starts to flow. While during T peak to T end, uh, we're really looking at only the uh, potassium outflow currents. And we'll go to the next slide. <clears throat> and uh, the topic here is uh, an introduction to the 
uh, two analysis methods which have been published, <clears throat> uh, both of them in clinical pharmacology and therapeutics. The first publication was the FDA publication, of course, uh, back in uh, 2014. And more recently, uh, the publication using the Rhythm Express method appearing in the same journal uh, at the end of last year. <clears throat> now, these uh, two analysis methods yielded generally similar results. Uh, dofetilide and quinidine, which are strong herd potassium channel blockers, prolonged QTC, as expected, uh, and did so by lengthening both J to T peak and T peak to T end to a similar degree. And you can see, looking in the uh, uh, image on uh, the right side, I mean the left side, sorry, of the right panel, <clears throat> that QTC, JTC peak, and um, uh, T peak to T end, uh, sorry about that interruption, all uh, are have rising slopes. Now, ranolazine, which is a uh, herd potassium channel and late sodium channel blocker, had a smaller effect on QTC because it actually shortened J to T uh, peak, uh, which you can see in the uh, graph on the right, uh, the orange downsloping uh, slope for J to T peak. Uh, it did have a positive effect, as expected, on T-peak to T-end, but the net result is a lesser QT effect. Rapamil will not show because at the doses used in this study, it, it did not have any effect on the T-wave. Now, the, the similarity in the results of the two studies is a, a corroboration of FDA's methods and their findings. But there were some interesting and important differences in certain details of these findings, and we'll spend most of the rest of our time talking about those differences and uh, what they signify. Now, the, the first difference is shown in the slide that uh, appears now, uh, or the first similarity, I'll say, is that J to, uh, JT peak corrected for heart rate, which is shown in the middle panel on the right, was very similar for the two methods, no real difference. But there were differences for uh, QTCF in the upper panel and TP to TN in the lower panel, uh, specifically for uh, quinidine endofetilide. And these uh, differences were fairly substantial, as you can see, and they were statistically significant. Uh, the specific differences were uh, that the um, QTCF and the TP to T end values were shorter for defetilide and quinidine in the Rhythm Express analysis compared to that of the FDA. Now, there are some obvious explanations uh, for these differences in the algorithm, algorithm results. Uh, first, the FDA software often included part or even all of the, the U-wave when present uh, within the QT interval measurement, and of course that resulted in a shorter mean QTCF for Rhythm Express, with, which did not include U-wave. Uh, the FDA software usually identified the first peak of a bifid T-wave as T-peak. Uh, it always picked the first uh, or the largest peak, and that's usually the first. While Rhythm Express consistently identified the second peak, resulting in a shorter T peak to TN for Rhythm Express. And you can see those results on the slide on the right, or the diagrams on the right. Now we'll go on to the, the next slide to discuss whether or not these differences really matter. And uh, uh, we will develop the theme that they do. Uh, we're looking at one assessment of the differences, and that is an assessment of measurement consistency. And we're using 
the repeatability standard deviation to do this, the formula shown on the right of the slide. Here, uh, the triplicate measurements, three ECGs at each time point, were considered repeated measures. And uh, evaluating the uh, RSD, repeatability standard deviation, uh, gave us the results shown in the table. Um, and uh, to clarify what these mean, uh, they predict that the absolute difference between measurements within a triplicate will be below the RSD value with 90% probability. And what we see is that that value is smaller for Rhythm Express for all three measures, and you can see the percent difference, the percent smaller uh, in the right-hand column. So we have a smaller repeatability standard deviation for Rhythm Express. We go on to the next slide and show you a uh, visual representation of that phenomenon. <clears throat> Here we're looking at the concentration effect models um, for the uh, quinidine and dofetilide uh, for the three biomarkers, ECG biomarkers, uh, using the FDA method on the uh, left, Rhythm Express on the right of uh, the four sets of columns. And if you will look at the confidence band, which is the light pink color uh, overlaying the slope, the linear slope, you'll see that in every case the FDA confidence interval is a bit larger than the Rhythm Express confidence interval uh, for quinidine and for dofetilide. If we look at the bottom pair uh, on the left, I think you can see this very easily, the confidence band in the FDA assessment for quinidine being uh, much wider than that for um, Rhythm Express. Well, so what? <clears throat> Does that really matter? Uh, as we'll see on the next slide, in, indeed it does have uh, rather large implications for clinical trials. Uh, what we're looking at here is a representation of uh, how variations in standard deviation can uh, affect sample size. Uh, and here we're, we imagine a um, uh, an attempt to detect whether a uh, change in te teaching method can improve test scores in a classroom. And what we want to detect is an improvement of at least five points from 75 to 80. And we ask the question, how many students are going to be needed, that is the sample size, to detect such a difference based on the known standard deviation? On the right, we see <clears throat> two curves, two power curves, one for a standard deviation of the uh, test result of 15 uh, in red <clears throat> and in blue, 10. And what we realize from this is that this 33% improve, improvement in standard deviation from 15 to 10 has a huge uh, implication for sample size. Uh, if you look at the uh, vertical blue line to the far right of this graph, we see that to achieve a power of 80, uh, we're going to need 57 students with the standard deviation set at 15. If you look at the uh, corresponding vertical line for uh, the standard deviation of 10, you see that that sample requirement drops to uh, 23, a 60% improvement. So there is a very large effect of uh, standard deviation on sample size requirement. Now we extend this um, analysis in the next slide, uh, which shows uh, a similar <clears throat> result, but uh, the, the purpose of it is to uh, show you that we can 
we have a choice. Uh, we can either reduce the number of subjects in a study or in an in ECG intensive study, we can choose to reduce the number of ECGs recorded or we could do a little of both. Here we're imagining a, a 40 subject uh, crossover with a uh, DDQTCF standard deviation of 12. Uh, we're recording three ECGs per time point. Now, if we reduce the standard deviation, uh, the 12 millisecond standard deviation by 16.6%, if you look at the chart below, we find that that would allow us to reduce sample size by more than a quarter and ECG uh, number by more than one half. And you see the corresponding values for a 33% improvement in standard deviation are considerable, sample size down by 50%, or ECG number down by 76%. Going on to the, uh, the last slide, uh, conclusions. Uh, I'd like to draw the, the following conclusions. First, the FDA method of concentration effect analysis of QTCF and uh, T-wave segments was corroborated by performance of the same analyses using Rhythm Express. Uh, so this means that both software methods, methods can be used in CE modeling for drug approval uh, as well as for identification of the ion channels affected by a tested drug. A Rhythm Express results had lower variance and therefore better repeatability, and this allows for reduced sample size or reduced number of ECGs in the trial. And finally, given the emphasis in CIPA on preclinical studies, I think it would make sense to extend the use of concentration effect modeling to preclinical animal models, something that not a, is not being done routinely now. Well, thank you for your attention. For the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to be talking about advances in fully automated and semi-automated detection of arrhythmias in preclinical studies to sort of complement uh, Jay's slide deck on the clinical side. I always like to go through some history of some of the topics that I'm discussing. And, and in the case of proarrhythmia, uh, we can stretch back uh, 20 years or more to look at some of the regulatory documents uh, discussing the genesis of both safety pharmacology and uh, the examination of proarrhythmogenesis. So back in 1997, some of you remember the International Conference on Harmonization started dabbling with uh, the concept of assessing secondary pharmacodynamics and safety pharmacology and sort of inserted a sentence or two into the documents M3 and S6, basically looking at functional effects on major physiological systems such as CNS and cardiovascular. But then it, it, when 2000, came around, uh, the S7A document was put forward, and this was really the first uh, detailed uh, description or at least inclusion of the words uh, proarrhythmia in the regulatory guidances. And you can see by 2.7.2, the S7A document started talking about uh, different parameters that should be looked at in the cardiovascular system, and, and as we all know, we look at blood pressure, a heart rate and ECG and a variety of different methodologies should be considered. And then there was a note uh, talking about no scientific consensus on preferred approaches to looking at arrhythmias. So at least the idea of uh, not only looking at CV function, but also arrhythmias was being put out, again, uh, about 20 years ago or so ago. And in 2005, uh, the S7B document started to look at uh, in vitro methods of proarrhythmogenesis, and this is where we got into uh, things like ion channels and Purkinje fibers and Langendorf hearts. And fast forward to uh, just a few months ago, uh, Mike Pugsley and a number of colleagues from, from industry published a paper in Farm Tox Methods uh, where they detailed the results of a survey uh, about 
uh, ECG recordings and safety pharmacology practices. And, and I have a couple of uh, key points from this, this publication, again, detailing these survey results. It's nobody surprised, almost 90% of the industry uses implantable telemetry. It sounded like that was uh, fairly in line with uh, Haley's poll earlier. But interestingly, yet only 22 to 40% of that same cohort detailed any attempt on examining arrhythmias. And from this above pool of folks, the question was answered, uh, have you encountered drug-induced arrhythmia? You can see certainly in the dog, uh, up to almost 80% of folks saw some type of uh, arrhythmia occurring in their studies, their preclinical studies, and a majority of folks as well in the non-human priming. So the question, an easy question from looking at that data is what is happening in the missing 60 to 80% from point two? What are those folks doing? Uh, interesting, my, my, interestingly, Mike uh, Pugsley and, and the group included this and had some references behind it and saying, unfortunately, the sensitivity of preclinical safety models to drug-induced arrhythmia development has been erroneously perceived to be lower than the sensitivity in the human population. So if you want more detail on that, I'd, I'd encourage you to look at that paper. It's a, it's a nice, uh, a nice uh, survey result. So keeping that in mind, I'm going to detail a case study from about 10 years ago from our labs. Uh, we published this in British Journal of Farm uh, with some colleagues who were at Roche at the time. And what, what happened in that study uh, was twofold. The first was uh, looking at the results of a tox study, looking at a CCR5 antagonist following uh, two weeks dosing in non-human primates. And upon doing the pathology for that tox study, it was noted that there were moderate myocardial degenerative lesions at the uh, mid and high dose uh, of a series of 50, 250 and 750 milligram per kilogram. The clinical signs at that uh, mid dose uh, were, were mortality uh, at eight days of dosing with no other signs prior to that mortality and one female out of two. Uh, one male out of two would, was euthanized in extremis. And then performing standard tox restrained ECGs, it was noted that there was a decrease in heart rate and then an increase in both PR interval and QTC. Again, no other clinical signs were noted prior to the morbidity mortality, no changes in hematology or ClinPath. Uh, I guess hypoactivity was noted uh, prior to mortality. So again, for prior to day eight, not much, and then day eight we saw some things going on. So three questions can be asked here. What caused the mortality in this talk study? What may have happened prior to mortality that, that could be illustrative? And then was there a biomarker that we could take forward uh, as a potential predictor for this? So we conducted in our labs a follow-up uh, 24 monkey telemetry study uh, looking at, or sorry, 23 monkey, looking at two dose levels, uh, 50 and 250 milligram per kilogram. Recall that 250 milligram was the dose where we started to see effects in the TOC study. All subjects received vehicle on D0 and then were separated into three cohorts as above, again, the active arms and then a comparator uh, control arm. And we used implanted telemetry here to record cardiovascular waveforms continuously for up to 10 days. We did use an automated output of ECG intervals, PR, QRS, QTC, et cetera. However, back about 10 years ago, there was not really reliable software to do automated arrhythmia analysis. So once all these waveforms collected, uh, we charged a variety of uh, folks uh, to do manual overview. So if you do the math here and you look at a standard monkey, uh, the average heart rate over the course of a day is about 100 beats per minute, and you, and again, do all the multiplication and whatnot. At the end of the study, we had about 19 million cardiac cycles to look at. And I can tell you that uh, manual visual review on that study took about three weeks with about three folks working uh, full days every week to do this. So uh, a very intensive uh, resource commitment. So what did we find? Uh, this particular monkey will be uh, used again over a number of slides here to show you what, what was observed. And what you see on the screen now is a typical uh, non-human primate telemetry waveform. Uh, this is pre-dose on day one, um, clear QRS complex with P waves and T waves. And as we go to the next slide, which is post-dose on day three, 
again, of the 250 milligram per kilogram, you do see a visual change in the morphology, uh, definite uh, changes in, in all the major uh, milestones there, P wave, the Q, uh, the T wave is getting larger, the QRS is changing. Moving on to post-dose on uh, day six. Actually, I think we skipped ahead two slides. This is six hours post-dose on day three. Uh, you can see resolution of the previously uh, different ECG, although there's still some large T wave there. And then on the next slide, uh, post-dose day five, uh, the same monkey you saw runs of ventricular tachycardia and clearly abnormal rhythm uh, following the resolution of that uh, VTAC. Four hours on post-dose day eight, uh, we really see some exciting things going on from a scientific perspective. You can see uh, runs of PVCs and VTAC followed by a very large or long run of VTAC on the right side. Now again, rem reminder from the TOC study, this is when we first saw, saw mortality. In this telemetry study, um, we did see fatal VF occurring at about Tmax on day eight uh, post-dose. So this took a long time, again, three folks, three weeks of labor to search through 19 million cardiac cycles and identify uh, not only the cause of mortality, but what was going on before that. So you see the publication here on the right, uh, what caused the mortality in this study, fatal cardiac arrhythmia, uh, what happened prior to that mortality. By telemetry, we noted ECG changes as soon as day three, and obviously, uh, saying that, there definitely was an identifiable bio biomarker, but it took a few weeks of manual resources to identify. As you can imagine, uh, the sponsor in this case was uh, keen to get that data as quick as possible. And while we had a few folks working on it, I'm sure most folks don't like to scroll through almost 20 million ECGs um, eight hours a day, every day of the week. So um, the question can be asked now 10 years later, uh, there's got to be a better way to do this. And I'm going to now talk about a case study from uh, just a few months ago. Uh, but before we go into that, our labs have been using the Rhythm Express software for a while now. And uh, we, had been, we had used this previous in our labs uh, about a year or so ago on a, on a different monkey CV study to analyze uh, loss or, or differences in one-to-one -one AV conduction across groups. And in this particular study, we queried telemetry waveforms to interrogate for supraventricular arrhythmia specifically. And we, in this study, we had about 3 million cardiac cycles. And I can tell you that the software was able to plow through this in minutes to hours versus weeks uh, from the 10-year-old uh, case study. So on the table on the right, we have four monkeys, one, two, three, and four. The vertical columns within each monkey are the dose response vehicle up to high dose, and then the horizontal rows are selected uh, arrhythmias of interest, the ones that have the red bars. Uh, I highlighted those because the software clearly identified uh, dose responsive changes in those. I'll just focus on monkey one. Uh, the results were repetitive in the other ones, but is when you look at percent sinus rhythm, the vehicle animals, again, about 100% of those were 100% of all cardiac cycles were sinus, and by the high dose, we were down to 87%. The occurrence of late beats and superventricular ectopy is noted here, very few in the vehicle, and when you go to the high dose, you can see uh, in the thousands, if not greater than 10,000 occurrences of ectopy, and then, again, uh, simple things like average five-minute rate, clearly down from 122 to 76 uh, you can see already the power of the software versus the manual overread where we're just doing more of a qualitative approach. Here we're able to quantify specific types of arrhythmia again in a very short period of time. So in this particular case study, uh, we had a compound we've called CORE-D1. Um, we had a variety of uh, cardiovascular information presented to us on this. And, and now it's popped up on my screen. 
On this particular data package, we had no appreciable antagonism against uh, cardiac ion channels, including those involved with conduction mechanisms. Uh, TOC studies for this compound did identify increases in both PR interval and QRS duration, and the highest doses, which we'll call high plus, uh, included visually apparent AV block, again, on the TOX uh, restrained ECGs. We did some Langendorf work. We cor corroborated the uh, changes in uh, AV conduction and also QRS uh, prolongation. And then uh, we subsequently designed a subsequent dog CV safety pharmacology to ask questions very similar to the case study from 10 years ago. So one, can we characterize the apparent risk from the in vitro and in vivo findings? Can we stratify a monitorable ECG change ideally prior to AV block? Can we quantitate those ECG changes with a high degree of fidelity? And then hopefully we can we identify some dose responsive um, results to the above. So again, uh, this data was taken from a wide uh, variety of studies and utilizing the analysis of the telemetry waveforms I have uh, two representative examples shown here. On the top, you see an individual animal's uh, PR interval, and on the bottom, the QRS duration. And in both of these graphs, the black bars uh, that are pretty flat across the time span are the vehicle dose groups. The red is the low dose, the green is the mid dose, and the purple is the high dose. So again, we've corroborated not only the tox, uh, results where we, in this telemetry study, we saw increases in PR and QRS intervals. Uh, those were also seen in the isolated heart assay, and they were seen in this as well. So we had uh, quantifiable ECG changes with a high degree of fidelity, and thankfully, as noted here, clearly dose responsive. Now, when we look at the uh, query of the arrhythmogenesis as quantified by Rhythm Express, if you recall, that green line on both those graphs clearly saw some interval prolongations. So we queried the software and asked, were the ECG changes prior to arrhythmia? And I have the control table on the left and that green line mid-dose arrhythmogenesis table on the right. And we preloaded the software with questions about different types of, of both uh, supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmias. And you can see in the control state, and this is very similar to what we'll see in the baseline state, there's very few arrhythmias uh, happening in this set of animals. Now, nice, uh, a nice result was that even though we saw interval prolongations uh, looking at the ECG quantitative data, when you do the arrhythmia analysis, we did not see any arrhythmias at that mid-dose. So we did see ECG changes prior to arrhythmia. Now, when we look at the mid-dose versus the high-dose, uh, you can start to see the development of AV block, as noted by the red highlighted values on the right table for the high-dose animals. And again, that was, uh, as we would expect, peri uh, T-max. When we looked at a table of uh, intraventricular, intraventricular conduction delays, we have basically four sets of uh, cohorts here. This is the zero, the vehicle animals, the low doses as you go down the table, the mid dose and the high dose. You can again see even though we had interval changes uh, at the green, the mid dose, there was no evidence of interventricular conduction delays. And those only occurred in the high dose animals in two out of four subjects, again, at the time around T max. So in summary, when we put uh, an integrated risk assessment together for this core D1 molecule, we found progressive cardiovascular effect as the plasma levels of the compound increased along with the dose. We did see an increase in PR interval and QRS duration times present in multiple animal models and was concentration responsive. What was very important though to the risk assessment was the automated ECG and arrhythmia analysis delivered both characterization of the risk so we definitely demonstrated ECG changes along with arrhythmia burden at the high dose, but not the mid dose. We had stratified clinically monitorable ECG changes prior to arrhythmia, uh, something the uh, clinicians are very interested in 
knowing about. And all of this allowed us a calculation of the safety margin with including the biomarker and putting the ECG changes and the AV block in perspective uh, within that safety margin. So as far as a concluding slide, uh, our stance is that automated ECG interval analysis and arrhythmia interrogation should be included on all IND enabling CV telemetry assessments. It's very easy to do. Uh, from the survey and from our own history, we, we certainly know that arrhythmias are commonly encountered in preclinical studies. They're definitely a critical component of the EV integrated CV risk assessment. And you can readily compare both pre-study and vehicle controls versus the active cohorts. Again, getting data in generally a very short period of time. The software does provide evidence vis-a-vis -vis lack of proarrhythmogenesis. Now, that's somewhat limited by the study design construct, but still vitally important. We can stratify the presence of rhythm disturbances uh, across the myocardium, uh, looking at supraventricular arrhythmias, conduction delays, and ventricular arrhythmias. Identify the escalation of the arrhythmogenesis, time and dose dependent, is it related to Tmax or not? And again, interrogate the presence and usability of ECG biomarkers. Our laboratory uh, uses these uh, automated assessments uh, in screening and non-GLP paradigms as well. And I think the critical thing to take away here is during these important studies when you think you may have arrhythmias, uh, the timelines seem much more compressed than, than they are generally. And getting results in minutes to hours is certainly helpful to project team uh, decision making. So with that, uh, I will conclude and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your presentation today, Mike. Um, so at this point, I'm going to welcome all questions for both presenters um, to come on in. And I will also invite everyone back to the audio line, but we also have um, Bob Brockway from VivaQuant joining us um, this morning as well to answer some questions that have come through. Um, so to get us started, I will um, ask a question to you, Bob, um, from Sandy. What species has the platform been qualified or used for? Yeah, thank you, Haley and Sandy, for the question. So the, the uh, Rhythm Express software has been validated for use in humans, in dogs, in non-human primates, in mini pigs, and then recently uh, for use in rats and in guinea pigs. And this includes interval and arrhythmia assessment, including, uh, for example, ventricular topic beat assessment. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Mason, are there situations in which you cannot or should not use concentration ECG modeling? Uh, thank you, uh, Haley, for that question. It's a, a very good question. And the answer is, uh, yes, indeed, there are. Uh, and I'll just mention a few of them. Uh, probably the most important one is when there is uh, pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic hysteresis. Uh, in, in the presence of, uh, let's say, a delay in the appearance of a QT effect, uh, in relationship to a um, sorry, uh, in relationship to uh, plasma concentration, then CE modeling is very difficult to use. Uh, there are some statistical approaches that have been uh, suggested and used, but um, they're iffy. So that's one situation. Another one is if uh, the drug has a, a very long, constant uh, plasma concentration, uh, uh, like a monoclonal antibody, for example. Uh, in this case, we don't have enough variation in concentration uh, to do concentration effect modeling. Uh, another in instance would be um, herbal drugs. Traditional Chinese uh, medications uh, often have uh, multiple components, and the actual active or effective component may not be known. So here we don't know what moiety to uh, measure the concentration of uh, to relate it to uh, ECG effect. Um, 
There are uh, a, a few others, but these are the, the most prominent ones. Thanks. Thank you, Jay. Um, Dr. Gorlinski, can you discuss differences between ruling a compound out versus ruling one in, so positive versus negative results, um, and using the automated software? Yes, uh, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for that question. Yeah, it, it, there's there's a couple of ways to look at uh, what we're doing here, and and again, sometimes this applies differently for uh, IND enabling studies versus maybe some earlier studies. So sometimes uh, with earlier compounds, you're looking to um, uh, you know triage compounds and and whatnot, and oftentimes. You know what we're doing with this. Uh, the power of the software allows us to not only meet uh, safety requirements for human, but also importantly for smaller biotech companies to meet uh, due diligence requirements for positioning their compounds for sale. So what I mean by that is, is sometimes uh, the thresholds are a little bit different. If uh, the compound ultimately is going to end up for sale from a small company to a large company. And that bar is a little bit different. So, um, you know, that, that can be a slightly different uh, need than uh, fulfilling the requirements of a GLP study. From ruling a compound uh, in, we've seen that happen with actually manual review of waveforms that um, unfortunately misclassified ECG abnormalities as arrhythmias when they really were not. Uh, so we've 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 run some uh, some waveforms that were acquired, uh, you know, prior or before rhythm analysis were conducted, and uh, the technician actually um, from some of the conducting laboratories misidentified arrhythmias. So we were to go actually to go back and be able to use the software to save compounds, um, which is always you know appreciated. I think. Perfect. Thank you so much. While I've got you, um, Core D1 compound has the profile of an NA channel blocker. However, parent compound had a non-effect on ionic channels. Is this an indication that a metabolite with NA channel blocking properties was formed in vivo? Yeah, I saw this question and I actually smiled because um, uh, Christian, who wrote that question, actually uh, was very prescient there because we had those discussions uh, with the client and what we ended up um, doing to answer that question was um, using the Langendorf assay. So we put that parent compound in there. Uh, there'd be no uh, metabolism occurring and we did see the same results, the increase in PR interval, the QRS prolongation. So there were sodium channel like effects present from the metabolite or from the parent compound in uh, the Langendorf study. So, again, just speaks sort of the complexity of these things. And while we while we have, have not yet ruled out that metabolite uh, may be playing a role here, it seems that unfortunately we have a little bit of discordance between the ion channel assays and the whole heart and in vivo assays uh, on face value. Great, thank you. Um, and. Dr. Mason, we have another question from uh, from the same uh, attendee, Christian. The FDA and Rhythm Express methods do not use the same feudical points for the assessment of TP and T offset. Which of the two methods best represents clinically relevant safety endpoints? Uh, well, thank you for that, uh, Christian. I uh, appreciate the question. Uh, Christian is a uh, a uh, long-term colleague of mine, and he knows very well I can't answer that question. That's why I asked it. <laughs> but it, it is an interesting question. We, we would we would need to have a long-term study in which we use both measurement methods, and uh, then we would have to wait and see which of the people in this large study had uh, uh, arrhythmias or died suddenly. Uh, to, to truly answer that question, but uh, we can speculate a bit about it. Um, the, the Rhythm Express method gives you a shorter QTCF and a shorter T peak to T end, uh, 
and traditionally T peak to T end has been thought to be the the better clinical uh, clinical indicator of risk, um, better than J to T peak. Now, getting these shorter values with Rhythm Express would probably be very appealing to a sponsor because basically we're saying that that drug is uh, marginally safer uh, using the Rhythm, Rhythm Express results. Uh, on the other hand, if you're the patient receiving that drug, you want to be cautious as you can possibly be and perhaps err on the side of uh, overcaution. So I think it, from, from uh, various perspectives, one or the other measurement method could be preferred because of these differences in fiducial points, uh, resulting in differences in the actual values. But I think it'll be a long, long time before we know the real truth about uh, the risk prediction. Thanks. Thank you, Jay. Um, and Bob, I'm going to bring you back on for one final question. Yu Jing has asked, is the Rhythm Express software from VivaQuant GLP validated? Yes, so thank you for the question. And yes, in fact, it is GLP validation, val validated. And in fact, um, we just fairly recently went through the most uh, recent validation of the newest build um, with uh, very, very extensive documented validation testing. We have done uh, quite a number of GLP compliant studies, and we have uh, a quality assurance unit on staff. We have a board certified cardiologist that reviews and signs off on these reports. And we have also undergone an internal uh, GLP audit of our documentation system. So yes, we are fully prepared to perform GLP studies.